I'd been working for a couple of years as a paramedic after I graduated from school. The place where I worked primarily was in the city, but our service area was in the entire county, which is very rural. When you're in school, you go on ride-alongs. You practice your skills with your preceptors on patients, very similar to residency or internship. Your exposure to the job is what you get while on those ride-alongs. Sometimes you get seriously injured patients and it's terrifying because you sometimes don't always know what to do. You're still learning, but you have your preceptor at your back to protect you from any fuck-ups and guide you. Sometimes though, you don't get lucky enough to experience some of these horrible things. To some, that may seem like a good thing, but it's important to experience these as it prepares you for a time when you're all alone. There are a couple of terms we use, called white, white cloud and black cloud. White cloud refers to a person, either student or professional, who never gets the exciting, serious calls. The calls always seem to come when you were just getting off shift, or you left the area, or where the call came in. Now another ambulance takes it, and this white cloud can follow this person for any length of time. Black cloud is the opposite. When I was in school, I was a white cloud. I got a few cardiac arrests, bad accidents, things like that, but nothing that ever really stood out as unique. So a couple of years into my career, this white cloud is still hang kind of hanging over me. That's not to say I hadn't had bad calls before that. I have, but it's not the same. The day this story takes place is Christmas Eve. I worked from 7am Christmas Eve to 7am Christmas Day. From what I remember, the day was pretty slow. Most people are with their families, not going outside, getting into accidents or causing mischief. I was working with the charge medic at the time, and a brand new EMT who was going through his FTO, field orientation process, was with us. A few of my co-workers had made a Christmas dinner that day, so we all had hot food to enjoy while we had to work, and be away from our families. At our station, we had two ambulances there with two crews, myself, my partner, and our FTO, and the other crew. When night comes, if a call comes into our station, the two crews just rotate calls so that we get to sleep a little bit more. It was around 11pm and I was sitting in the recliner watching TV. A call came into our station that required us to respond out to the county. One of the guys on the other crew, who was a friend of mine, was asleep in the recliner next to me, so I took the call. The call was initially for a woman who had fallen and hit her head, but was conscious and breathing. Due to the nature of the injury, we responded emergence. It was probably about a 50 minute drive to get to the person's house. As we're getting close, dispatch informs us, now the PT is not conscious, but still breathing. As we approach the residence, driving down the street where this little development is, there are flashing lights everywhere. Sheriff's deputies, police, fire departments are all there. With some blocking the entrance to the streets. For just a simple head injury, we thought that was pretty weird, and it set a weird vibe for the call. One of the deputies saw us coming and moved his car, allowing us through. Once we got through, this part of the street ended in a cul de sac with houses all around it. People were standing on the front porches around, looking at what was going on. We arrived at the address. There's a vehicle parked in the driveway, still running with officers all around. The driver's side door was open, and there was an officer standing there and looking like he was talking to someone sitting in the driver's seat. I walked up first with my partner and our EMT FTO behind me. As I approached the rear of the vehicle, I see there is definitely someone sitting inside. There is also a man, middle-aged, in plain clothes, standing in front of the vehicle, his lower half lit up by the headlights. He has his hands in his pockets, and is looking rather intently at the person in the vehicle. I walk up to the officer and get a report from him. While the officer tells me what's going on, I look at the person in the driver's seat. The person sitting in the driver's seat was a middle-aged woman, maybe mid-40s or 50s, sitting back with her head against the headrest. Her arms were hanging down by her side. I can visibly see her breathing, hear her moaning, but not talking. Her eyes are also closed. There's a bit of blood running from her head past her cheeks and down her chin. There's also a small stream of blood coming from her nose. The officers tell me that she was inside with the family when she came outside to get something from the car. The officer says that the woman's husband, and gestures to the man standing in front of the car, came out to check on her because she had been out there for a while. 
When the husband saw his wife bleeding, he figured she must have fallen or hit her head or something, so he called 911. The officer tells me the woman has not been responding to him. I attempt to speak to the woman. She does not answer me, but continues to moan. I perform a sternum rub to cause painful stimuli and hope to get some sort of reaction. No reaction. I ask the husband if she'd been drinking tonight, <clears throat> or if she abuses any drugs that he knows of. He says that she's had a few glasses of wine, but no drug use. At this point, I'm thinking she has a head injury and potentially a brain bleed, but she's not responding appropriately. I stand where the officer was standing in the driver's side door as I'm performing my assessment. I can't see where the blood is coming from, so I figure she has a laceration or something in her hair that isn't visible. It's at this time that the officer comes up to me. He says, we also found this in the driver's side door compartment. He produces a revolver. I look at the officer and look at the revolver. He looks at me and holds it out. I grab it and flip out the cylinder. And at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, oh fuck. In the cylinder is one brass casing with the primer indented, meaning a round has been fired. With this new information and based on the bleeding, I assumed the patient had put the gun to her temple or something. The fact that she is still breathing and making noises leads me to assume that she missed or well, the bullet miraculously bounced off if it, she held it at a weird angle. Due to the potential for significant head trauma, I decided that we needed to place a cervical collar on the woman, in case of spinal injury as well. I asked one of the firefighters to grab a collar out of our ambulance. I open the back door of the vehicle and get in behind the woman so I can hold her head stable while the fireman places the collar on. It's only when I do that that I realize what is really going on. As I slide in behind the patient, I can see the back of her head, something I will never be able to unsee. Looking at the back of her head, I see a grapefruit sized hole. With my flashlights, I look at the hole and it's almost empty, except for a large piece of skull that is floating on top of a blood and brain soup. I look up and on the headline of the vehicle is a two foot diameter halo of blood and brain printed above her with tiny pieces of skull stuck into the fabric. I look back at the hole. It's a chilly night, so I can see heat vapors coming out of the hole, similar to how you'll be able to see your breath on a cold day. I look at the vehicle and my partner and I say, we need to go now. Either the look on my face or the sense caused him to peek inside the vehicle and see what I was seeing. His eyes grew wide and all he said was, holy shit. Our EMT FDO quickly went to the ambulance and grabbed the stretch from the backboard. Up until this point, we were taking our time carefully getting out of the vehicle, but now, carefully and slowly, turned into just get her out of the vehicle. Our EMT also grabbed me a few large trauma dressing and gauze wrap. I placed the trauma dressing over the hole and wrapped the ever-living shit out of it around her head so that when we moved her onto the stretcher, nothing would spill out. With the help of the fire departments and police, we moved the woman onto the backboard and put her on the stretcher. The whole time, the husband has been standing at the front of the vehicle watching, not understanding what's happened. As we get the woman on the stretcher, he comes over and I can see he now has tears in his face. He bends down, kisses her on the cheek and says, I love you. We quickly get the woman in the ambulance. Due to the woman's injury, the cerebrum, largest part of the brain, is almost completely gone meaning she has no motor function, no muscle tone, and no cognitive abilities. Her brainstem, however, is still intact. The bullet missed it. The brainstem controls the body's autonomic functions, like respiratory rate, heart rate, and blood pressure. Due to this, when we moved the woman to the stretcher, her tongue fell against the back of her oral airway, causing a blockage. I knew immediately this was going to happen, so I had my partner set up the intubation supplies for me. In the ambulance, I placed the laryngoscope, bladed device used in intubation, into the patient's mouth to move her jaw and tongue forward, opening her airway. I see the hole on the roof of the woman's mouth. I slide the endotracheal tube through the woman's vocal cords and into her trachea. This gives us a secured airway so we can ventilate the patient. My partner uses an intraosseous needle to obtain vascular access. Just the same thing as an IV, but it goes into the bone, and medication and fluids are absorbed by the bone marrow. 
I place the PT on the cardiac monitor, check her blood pressure and oxygen. At the time, I thought it was the strangest thing. Her blood pressure was actually good. Her heart rate was normal, her oxygen was good, and her cardiac rhythm was normal. We start transporting emergent to the hospital, and I give them a heads up, activating the trauma team. After the call, we went back to the station to restock the ambulance and clean up. That's when I saw all the bits of bone and blood on my pants and shirts. Luckily, the charge medic let me go home and take a shower and put on a new pair of clothes. After I changed, I went back to work and the rest of the shift was uneventful. I learned the next morning around 9am, the family had decided to remove life support and the woman passed away. For many years after the call, I didn't notice a change. I kept doing what I do best and never really thought I'd been affected by it all until I realised I was. A couple of years ago, I had a bad relationship that made me start thinking about myself and how I am. It was something that was always there, but I never really thought anything about it. I just thought it was my personality and who I developed into as an adult. I realised how angry I was. I was not a mean person, but very st simple stupid things would set me off and I had a bad temper. I was very cynical to the world, I still am. When I thought was a stomach problem, I started thinking maybe it's anxiety. I started that I want to figure out what caused me to be this way. I wanted to figure out why I think the way I do, why I act the way I do. So, I decided to see a psychologist. After many months visits, my psychologist came up with a PTSD diagnosis. I hated it at the time. I hated being characterized as someone with PTSD. It didn't make sense. I can handle anything. Nothing bothers me. But during those visits, as we conversed, the one thing that kept coming up was that call. I didn't realize how much it actually affected me. How much of a wall that I'd built to shut everyone out and not see who I really am, to protect myself. The more I thought about it, the more I came to realize that it probably makes, makes sense. The reason I tell the story the way I do, with the graphic detail, is because I think everyone needs to understand it's in its entirety. And mental health not only affects a single person, but everyone around them. Like I say, I'm not going to get preachy, so if you don't want to read past this, I understand, but I urge you to. This is something we talk about at work quite a lot, and there are several co-workers on the ambulance even now that I talk about with this stuff. One of, if not the number one cause of death for first responders is suicide. If you are someone who has thought about or attempted suicide in the past, you need to know that taking your life doesn't only affect you. You may think it will be better this way, but I assure you, people not. People often say how selfish suicide is, and it's true. Because once you're gone, you have no idea the amount of lives have been impacted by you. If you don't think this is true or that no one will care, maybe you need to go back and reread the story, because I guarantee people care. I care. So find someone, anyone, just to talk to. Be honest, let them know how you're feeling. I know it's hard. It was for me, but it does get better. You just have to try. So if anyone you know or does struggle with mental health issues, reach out. Just be an ear. You don't have to try and solve the problem, but just listen. If you listen, you may just hear something that can help save someone's life. And if you struggle with mental health issues and think there's no one for you to talk to, you're wrong. It can be a professional. It can be a person you consider a close friend or a relative. If you feel like none of these options work for you, or that you're considering doing something dangerous, go to your local emergency room. Call 911 because that's what they're all there for. Police, fire, EMS, ER staff. People may not think of these people to call when you're having a mental emergency, but I can tell you firsthand that we deal with this a lot more than you think. We are trained in how to deal with people in these situations. All of us. Even if you don't know what to say. If you even just make the call, it will get things started and hopefully you'll find the help you deserve. So, this happened two years ago when I was still in high school. Little bit of background. My mom, who lives in an apartment in the city I went to high school in, and since she lived not too far from school, I went and returned home by foot every day. The story happened during winter. So when I got out of school at 5 p.m., 
It was already dark outside. I remember perfectly when it happened. It was Friday evening, and for once, I didn't have classes on Saturday, so I took the time I had to go shopping with a friend. We finished around 6pm and separated to go back to our houses. It was maybe 6.30 when I arrived in the street where I lived, and I had two options. Entering the building by the front door, or entering by the back door, which was closer to where I was. So I chose the second option, and entered the alley where the gate was, and started to look for my keys. But when I opened my bag, I saw a shadow on the wall next to me, indicating that someone was behind me. The thing is, only residents of the building would go in this alley, since there was nothing else except the building's parking lot, closed by the gate. So clearly, the person had absolutely no reason of being there. I turned around to face a man, probably in his mid-thirties. I couldn't really see since it was dark, and there was only a street lamp a few meters behind him. I tend to panic really quickly, so I tried to stay calm. He said something to me, but since I had my earphones in, I asked him to repeat what he said thinking he was asking for directions or for help. He simply replied that all was going as planned and that he just wanted to know my name. I didn't want to give him my name, so I gave a fake one in hope that he would leave me, but he asked me if we could talk a bit and if I could give him my Snapchat ID because he wanted to know me better. I was really scared, but decided to stay polite since he could have been armed or something like that and I didn't want to upset him. I told him I didn't have Snapchat, which was true, and he stopped to smile. He said, why are you lying? Every pretty girl your age has Snapchat, otherwise how would you share your cute photos? I didn't know how to react, so I simply said it was the truth and that I needed to go back home to take care of my little brother. At one point, he must have noticed how scared I was, since he told me, am I scaring you? Why are you scared? I just want to talk with you and he actually started to yell in the street, saying that all the girls were the same and that he hated women. I tried to stay calm, but I couldn't speak. I was literally terrified, so I started to slowly walk towards the gate, but he screamed and told me not to move or he would rip my throat off. But then he calmed down and asked if I had a boyfriend. It was like speaking to two different people. I didn't want to reply, so he got mad again and walked towards me, like he wanted to hit me. I wanted to run to the gate since it was like 10 meters away, but I knew he would follow me and I needed to enter a code anyways, so he clearly could have hit me, or worse. At this moment, a car arrived in the alley. I didn't know the woman inside the car, but honestly, she was like my only escape, so I screamed for help. She opened her window, told me to get in the car and told the guy to move or she'll call the police. She waited with me, until the creepy dude finally left and made sure I got home safely. I'll never thank her enough for saving me this day. The guy was sincerely creepy as hell and to this day, I still think about what could have happened if the woman arrived a few seconds later. When I lived in Tuscan, I rented a home in a retirement community. I had a Harley Davidson and was living with my dog. A neighbor had a motorcycle as well, but was too old to ride and would stand outside and wave when I would ride by and take off. He lived just across from me. The neighbor next to him said he was a really nice guy and could use a friend and someone to help out from time to time with things, seeing as he was older and I was in my early 30s. One day, I'm on my ladder cutting branches on my mesquite tree. He asks if I can swing by afterwards and cut a few of his branches as well. I gladly said yes. We got to chatting and his wife of nearly 70 years had passed about five years prior and he said he'd been sad and lonely without her. He also told me he was a teacher for many years before retiring. As we parted ways, he asked if I could come by sometime and help him plug in a Blu-ray player he'd purchased. I told him, no problem. I came by to help install the Blu-ray player a few days later and he was making something to eat. He asked if I wanted to have a bite and if I was into whiskey. I told him I was an avid Jameson drinker in my 20s so he poured me some whiskey on the rocks. As we had some Batoli pasta before hooking up the Blu-ray player behind his TV, 
It was hard to get to, in an odd entertainment centre. He asks me, do you like wrestling? I have a good friend that lives near the base of Mount Lemon. He's about my age. Sometimes we have some of the younger guys over there and he has mats in the house. Everyone takes off their shirts and pants and wrestles. It's a lot of fun. Um, what the fuck? I told him that's not something I'm interested in. I became extremely uncomfortable. I decided to very quickly hook up a Blu-ray player so I could go home immediately. As I'm behind the TV and can't see him, he starts asking me if I enjoy watching pornography. That he has pornography videos on DVD that he can share with me. I almost smashed my head into the top of the entertainment center just as I was plugging the HDMI cable and he was asking me such a bizarre question. As quickly as humanly possible, I got out from behind the TV so I could see him and ensure I was safe from anything happening. Thankfully, he was just standing behind the couch, 15 feet away, watching while I finished. I told him, I'm not into that kind of thing. I've got to go. I quickly made a dash for the door and told him goodbye. From that point on, I never interacted with him. My damn motorcycle was very loud, so every time I leave, which was often, he'd hear it, come outside and watch while I rode off waving at me. When I'd come home late in the evenings, I could see in his front window where his computer and monitor were, and I swore there were videos of women playing on his monitor with his blinds wide open while he sat there. He never stopped long enough to see very many specifics about what he was watching. Considering he was a teacher in his former life in Minnesota, these completely bizarre and disgusting questions really frightened me about whether or not he might have been involved with younger people in the past. This was years ago. Those memories still freak me out these days when I think back. Near the beginning of the quarantine, sometime between June and August, I guess it's July, but I don't remember, I'd graduated from college, online, and I was living with my mom. I go to sleep very late, 2, 3, even 4 a.m., I think, because of anxiety and depression, because of COVID, and not seeing my boyfriend or anyone else. For context, I live on the second floor of a house in a wooded area with not many houses. There are no houses behind mine where my window faces. Only my backyard and wetlands are behind. I was watching YouTube with my window slightly open for fresh air at about 2am or so when I heard a voice outside my window. My first thought was it's my neighbour are talking to each other outside, although they are older and are not noisy, especially at 2am. Or it could be that my mom's TV is on in the other room loudly. I turned the video I was watching off and listened closer. What I hear was an androgynous younger sounding voice singing. Not well or trying really, just kind of trailing off and not very rhythmic. Kind of like the way a little girl sings in a horror movie, like Ring Around the Rosie. But it wasn't that song. I have no clue what the lyrics or song were, but it wasn't a modern one. I don't live near or in a big city, and I live in a very safe, small town. The voice seemed to be kind of singing in a low tone right below my window, like they were standing in my backyard. I opened the window very slowly and as quietly as possible, which confirmed to me even more than I was so quiet yet I could easily hear the singing, so it couldn't be my neighbour whose house was about a thousand feet away from mine. I was shocked at what I was hearing because I've never experienced anything creepy like this in my life, especially in my home. I just keep listening in shock, frozen in fear. I then realised it might be coming from my mom's room because she often falls asleep with the TV on. I was more terrified to see if my mom had a TV on or not, because what if it wasn't on? I mustered up the courage to go into my mom's room as quietly as possible. I walked in, and to my horror, there was silence. In a panic, I woke my mom up. She was really mad and loud when I woke her up, as she always is at me when I wake her. I told her to be quiet, and I told her in a hushed and panicked voice, with tears streaming down my face. I heard someone singing outside my window. She didn't believe me and thought I was being ridiculous, which is what I expected. I asked her to please come into my room with me quietly to try and hear. 
When we got into my room, there was silence. I slept on my mom's bed that night, and I think the night after. This incident was terrifying for me, and I didn't forget it for a long time. Fast forward to April 2021. My boyfriend now lives with my mom and me, which has helped with lessening my memory of the singing, as well as me working with people in person at a retail job. And now I go to sleep at 12 or maybe 1 a.m. Yesterday night, I was recalling the incident with my boyfriend when he told me that I've been telling him that I hear someone humming singing outside of our window at night since he's been living with me. Sometimes I call him, but most of the time we're together at night after we get back from work when I hear outside my window someone and ask him to listen. He never hears it though, and then I call him crazy, apparently not for hearing it, and then I just close the window and move on. He said this has happened 10 to 20 times. The problem is that I don't remember this happening more than once, when I was alone during the summer, and that's what he says. I say doesn't sound like how I would react if I heard the voice for a second and especially the 20th time. I would be terrified and not simply close the window if it was the second time I would have called the police. And I would not call my boyfriend crazy for not hearing what I heard. I would feel crazy if anything. I also consider myself to have a bad memory, but not for an event of significance, good or bad. I forget unimportant things I don't care about, like homework or something I said I would do. I was shocked and am shocked right now by the selective gap in my memory that has been happening. My memory and the fact that my boyfriend doesn't hear anything scares me greatly. And right now, I feel like I'm going crazy. I feel very out of control. I was crying a lot out of confusion last night. I've talked to my mom and boyfriend together about this. My mom basically told me to forget it, unless it happens again. If it does, then we should call the police, she said. She also said that I should talk with my therapist about this, which I am nervous about because I don't want to be told I'm crazy. I want to know what's going on, because, I, because what I heard the first time. But maybe that is what's going on. Maybe I'm having a psychotic break, I don't know. I feel like somebody might think my boyfriend is trying to gaslight me. I really doubt it, he's a very kind and selfless person, and we've been together for two awesome years and he helps me a lot. I still understand if you think that though. Hey everyone, for reference, I'm a 19 year old teenage girl who's fairly tall in structure. This takes place a couple months back, around October I'd say. Being extremely bored at college and my other friends hooking up left and right, I decided to jump on, on the Tinder bandwagon. Yeah, I know the risks and all that, but hey, I was bored and always made sure to inform my friends where I was at. When scrolling, I met this guy. Although I'm not the prettiest person in the world, I would definitely say I was lowering my standards with this particular pick. Large glasses, kind of chubby, in a cute way, and was only a couple inches taller than me. However, he seemed nice and said he was interested in pre-med. He seemed nice, liked to paint, I liked to draw, and was only a couple of years older than me. Why not? So I score all right and move on. Well, the next day, he messaged me several times, and I responded back. The dude seemed interested, if not, a little too interested. But hey, he wanted to get coffee in a public place, so I accepted. So we get coffee. This dude is definitely a nerd, but I like that. I'm really studious myself, and really like to force hard on my academics. He buys me coffee, and asks if I want to go back to his place. Red flag right there. But this guy was not someone that screamed date rape, frats, or intimidating. We go back and we make out, and it gets a little heated. Granted, I made it clear I wanted a relationship, not a hookup, and wasn't willing to give him sex, since I was and still am a virgin. Well, guess the guy was more experienced than I thought. Talked about his girlfriend, and how he was experienced. Gave the whole consent talk, which I thought was weird, but was cool with it. I want to add that I didn't really enjoy the whole makeouts on dressing parts, and honestly, was bored throughout the entire thing, and was faking it the whole time. Guy just didn't do it for me. So I leave and I walk home. End of story. Well, he hits me up the next day and asks me if he wants to hang again. I really don't want to, 
but my guy says it can be a study date. I try breaking it off, but he's persistent. Yeah, sure. I ask my mom, and she says go for it. Apparently the guy had a 4.0, so we must be smart. But I had homework shit to do, no funny business. He said it was fine. He lied. The second I got to his apartment, he tried to force me into having a drink, like the first time we met. I'm underage and he knows it. I say no. He insists. I laugh it off and get some water. Then, it gets weird. He tries to get me into his bed and begs for me to kiss him. Like persistent begging. Pathetic, persistent begging. I'm trying to study and ignore him and finally relent and give in. He set a timer for cuddle time, which turns into making out with me, and it was unpleasant. Then he tries to get me undressed. I tell him no. He begs and brings up how I undressed him last time. I relent again, after telling him several times no, and clearly being uncomfortable. He makes me undress him, which I found repulsive, and drags me into the shower. Trigger warning ahead. We get into the shower together, and pressing his erect penis against my arse. I start to freak out due to being sexually assaulted in the arse by an older man as a freshman. He then forcefully sticks a hand under my crotch and I yelp and smack his hand away. He apologises, becomes passively annoyed and we dry off and sit on his bed. This is when it gets worse. He makes a casual comment about how young he looks and I inquire him about it. Turns out he's 28, which was 10 years older than me at the time. I thought he was 21. What the fuck? I want out. I'm shaking at this point. Then, becoming extremely serious, he asks me why I'm still a virgin and why I wouldn't have sex with him. I tell him I'm a Christian, and he laughs and says, you're already undressed to me. I don't think you're that much of a Christian already. Fuck him. I want out. Then the begging begins again, with him giving lewd comments about my body. Your body is so beautiful, your tits are so pretty, etc. I'm almost in tears at this point, when he again begs and forces me to give him a hand job. I do what he asks and hand him a tissue, disgusted when he comes all over himself. This is when he gets really angry. He glared at me and tells me he has to take a phone call. This is my chance. I run over to my phone and text my guy friends to call me and bail me out. Luckily, my guy friend makes an, up an excuse and I put him on speaker. I'm trembling at this point. I can't stop. Seeing his mistake, the asswad begins to apologise profusely and I grab my bag, almost leaving my computer, and sprint out of there. After hiding out at a noodles and company for an hour, I make it back to my dorm in tears and shaking profusely while my roommates promptly ignored me. Did I report him? No. It turns out the guy's parents are filthy rich and related to powerful governmental leaders in China. My parents didn't care and just thought I had regrets. Tried committed suing, committing suicide right after, and constantly feel dirty. Still not over it, even though I wasn't technically raped.